Deuteronomy chapter 15. Start by reading that whole chapter. Deuteronomy 15. At the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, but that which is thine with thy brother thine hand shall release. Save when there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day, for the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren, within thy gates, in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand and thine eye be evil against thy brother, and thou givest him not. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in the land. And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock, and out of thy floor, and out of thy winepress, of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee this thing today. And it shall be, if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee and thine house, because he is well with thee, then thou shalt take an awl, and thrust it through his ear unto the door, and he shall be thy servant forever. And also unto thy maid servant thou shalt do likewise. It shall not be, seem hard unto thee, when thou sendest him away free from thee, for he hath been worth a double hired servant to thee, in serving thee six years, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all that thou doest. All the firstling males that come of thy herd and of thy flock thou shalt sanctify unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work with the firstling of thy bullock, nor shear the firstling of thy sheep. Thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year in the place which the Lord shall choose thou and thy household. And if there be any blemish therein, as if it be lame or blind or have any ill blemish, Thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt eat it within thy gates. The unclean and the clean persons shall eat it alike, as the roebuck and as the heart. Only thou shalt not eat the blood thereof. Thou shalt pour it upon the ground as water. Here in Deuteronomy 15, we see God's grace in situations where quite often men just, just have none. We're dealing with release. We're dealing with... Uh, when men owe and they have to become bond servants to pay it off. We're dealing with what many would call a chapter that endorses slavery in the Bible. But it's not so, actually. The scenario that God lays out and sets forth is actually one of, of great blessing for both the one who is, is holding the bond servant and the one that is the bond servant. Here's one thing that's completely foreign 
to our nation at this time, and that's in verse 1. It says, At the end of every seven years thou shalt make a release. Release simply means let go, set free. At the end of seven years, this thing called the Lord's release was to take place. Verse 2 describes it a little bit clearer. It says, And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. Shall what? Set free or let it go. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord release, Lord's release. Exact simply means demand or obtain. So he will release the debt, the creditor will, and he won't try to demand it. He won't try to obtain or receive it from his neighbor or his brother. He's simply to let it go. Just set it free. So this is a reset of sorts. And it says that very clearly this is of the Lord. In other words, this is having it so that you cannot get your brother, you cannot get your neighbor into perpetual bondage, but rather every seven years you will release it and it will be even Stevens essentially. You don't owe me a thing. I'm not going to exact it. I'm not going to demand it. I'm not going to obtain it from you. Verse 3 continues and talks of the foreigner. It says, Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, but that which is thine with thy brother, thine hand shall release. So of a foreigner, somebody passing through that, that borrowed of you, you may demand, you may obtain it again, but God is making it so that within his economy, within his nation of people, he would not have this perpetual debt system set up where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, where the creditors are the ones with all of the money and the power over people, and the poor would just simply always be in the state of being oppressed and constantly having the rich demanding of them and obtaining from them and exacting of them. Rather, the lender was to be gracious and let it go, set it free. Release that which is owed him. Now, if you lend, and I believe this is good practice as a Christian. First of all, Christians ought not get into financial dealings with Christians, if at all possible. Money always causes schisms with people, with family members, with members of the body of Christ, whatsoever. But if you do lend, and I have had friends over the years who were, who were Christians that weren't overly wealthy, but nevertheless they were overly generous. And the policy that they taught me, I believe, is one that is good for all believers to have, is that if you are going to lend something, just consider it gone. Just consider it released. Just consider, let it go, set it free. Don't expect to ever get it back, okay? Because the problem is, if we don't observe this good and fair practice of just letting it go, family and friends will be severed over money. And it happens all the time. But... We need to understand that our family and our friends and our brothers and sisters in Christ are worth way more than the money that could come between you. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree it's better to have a, a unity and bond? Wouldn't you agree it's better? But if you feel led to help somebody out, a good practice, and like I said, I've, I've known a few brothers that have played this out where they just considered it gone. And yeah, sometimes it doesn't get back. And I've been on the receiving end of that. And I've, I've went to a brother, that car that you see parked out there. When I bought that car from a brother, he... He bought it, he welded a bunch of stuff on the underside of it, he, uh, I think he changed out the brakes, put in a new light bulb, a few other things, got it humming again, and he just said, you know what, you, you owe me what I paid for it, that's it, no more, no less, just, just, I'll get the money back. But when he handed me those keys in the bill of sale, all I had bought for him at that moment was a coffee at Tim Hortons. And so he, he released that, and you know what, I tried to get on a payment plan. Eventually, I fell short of it, and, the, and I went to the brother. I said, hey, you know, and he's like, it's gone. It's nothing to me. Don't worry about it. We've exchanged this. This has already happened. I released it. I set it free. It's your car. The money will come to me when it does. And you know what? I paid that brother back in full eventually down the line, and he was surprised. He's like, you know, not many people, if I lend to them in that way, give it back. He's like, but my conscience is clear, and I don't hold it against them, and I, it doesn't bother me. And you know what? That brother, more often than not, I've seen the Lord bless him financially. I've seen, I've seen the Lord do great exploits with him financially. You know, use him as a giver in the body of Christ. And, and he's one of these guys that's almost just like a, a throughway, where God just drops a bunch of cash on him, and he wonders what in the world kind of a blessing this is, and then suddenly a need comes up, and he's like, oh, I see, Lord, and just kind of 
passes it on. He's just like a throughway. He's just like a, a pathway for the, for the financial blessings to come and go through him. But he's been well taken care of. And I've always noted that policy that he has. Of course, I'm not somebody who's ever felt that I'm able to lend and to give quite often. I'm, I'm often receiving of gifts more often than anything. But maybe that's just because I don't have enough faith in that area to just trust God. This man seemed to have great faith and just not even care about finances, and I think that's how God was able to use him in those areas. Good practice, though, I think. Scripturally, it was to be done to just release financial debts every seven years, let it go. A good practical thing I think a believer today could let it, could take from this, since we don't have that wonderful thing as the Lord's release in our nation, I think it should be just good practice to just let it go. If you're going to lend to your brother, let it go, and don't expect ever to get anything back necessarily, okay? Good policy, good practice, and it'll keep your conscience clear, first of all. Uh, continuing on in verse 4, save when there be no poor among you. So this release of the Lord, the Lord's release, was to go on until there be no poor among you. And if there be no poor among you, well, you got to think that nobody's really borrowing. No one's going to be having a creditor, you know, unless they're being covetous and trying to get more than they deserve or, or trying to, you know, move up to the bigger tent or something like that and, and borrowing. But really, if there's no poor among you, that means everybody has sufficient to their needs. And, and the Bible actually records here, if you continue in verse 4, For the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So that's not signifying that they, they just have sufficient to their needs, is it? God's, God, I think, is promising that when they enter this promised land, they'll be richly blessed. They'll have everything they need and abundantly more what they can ask or think. God is saying when you go into this land, you will be blessed beyond measure to the extent that there might not be any poor among you at some point. Save when the poor among you have this release for creditors and debtors to be able to make good every seven years. But don't worry about that because I plan to greatly bless you. I believe what God's saying here. But look at this. As he always does in Deuteronomy, there's always a condition. Don't lose track of that because even in the land promises, even in the, 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 the promises of blessings, God always puts conditions upon them. In verse 5 it says, Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day carefully observe to do the commandments. Does that mean you're sinless? Does that mean you're perfect? Does that mean you never fail in these things and all? No, but you are being careful to hear God's voice. You're being careful and attentive to observe to do these things. In other words, you're setting your heart and your desire towards keeping the God's commandments in any way. Of course, falling short, but what do you do when that happens? Repent. Ask for forgiveness. And He is faithful and just even in the Old Testament, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he had a whole economy set up of priests and sacrifices where if somebody did fall short of God's glory, certainly they could go with a repentant heart and say, God, forgive me. But then they could also make good on it by bringing the trespass offering, bringing the peace offering, bringing the sin offering unto God, slaying it there, and then he could have atonement for those sins at that particular time obviously always salvation has been great through grace through faith but even in our world i mean god isn't he's forgiven you all your sins but that doesn't necessarily mean that when you sin you're scot clear on everything certainly sometimes there is a there is a time where you're repentant you're remorseful you ask god for forgiveness sometimes he'll let you eat of the fruit of your own doing sometimes you have to go through a time of leanness and sacrifice for them, it was sacrificing some of their cattle or their herd. For us, sometimes, who knows how God might intervene to punish us, correct us, and get us on the right track. First and foremost, though, again, keep that short list. We're creditors to God when we sin against Him. Obviously, He's forgiven them all, forgotten as far as the east is from the west, but when we sin before Him, we're now in a debt to Him. So make it good, quick. Ask for forgiveness. Pray unto him, seek him, and say, God, forgive me for this thing, but merciful unto me, though I do deserve, certainly, your chastisement and your wrath to come upon me for such and such a thing. Your anger certainly burns hot towards what I did, but God, forgive me. And quite often with his own children, he's quick to forgive them, even as we do with our children. So continuing in verse 6, it says, For the Lord thy God 
blesseth thee as he promised thee. And is it good to have the promises of God? He doesn't lie. So when he says, I promise to bless thee, they can just take that to the bank and say, it's a sure thing. It continues on in verse 6 and says, And thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over me. So the promise here, again, conditional on obedience, again, conditional on them being careful to hear his voice and being observant to keeping those commandments. He says, you shall be richly blessed, as I promised, lending to many, but never borrowing, reigning over many, but never having these nations reigning over you. Obviously, obedience was always there, and obviously that stipulation of the release was always part of their economy, and so they would get very rich. They would get very powerful, but then hey, God would just equalize it in the nation so that there would never be that covetous spirit coming over his people Israel. But look, nowadays, the Jews, the synagogue of Satan wicked false Israel that's over there in the Middle East and their little splinter cells that are set up in New York City and in other parts of the world under that Kabbalist, Judaistic, um, Federal Reserve system, that synagogue of Satan type of today, they'll look at a verse like this and see, oh look, God promised us that, what? We're going to lend to many nations and we're never going to borrow. And God promised that we're going to reign over many nations will never be ruled over. And so they've set up this wicked system under what they perceive as an unconditional promise of God. Okay, read the context. It's easy to debunk that, right? The Judaism and the Kabbalah and all of these, these wicked synagogues of Satan types, the Rothschilds, etc., have set up a system where they've tried to basically make these promises come true in their own life. And instead of realizing that God here is showing grace unto nations around them and people around them, they've used these promises to basically overlord people and destroy people. They've made money and merchandise off the people of this world through rebellion to the scriptures, in essential. They, they, they use deceit. They use scams. They use wickedness. They fund both sides of wars and then just reap the benefit of of murder of millions of people and suffering of nations at large. They rule over Hollywood and all of the stuff that goes on there. The smut industry is entirely theirs, and they think they're delivered to do these things. Why? Because God promised us that we would rule over these people. Who are these, right? God promised that we would lend unto these people. And we would be able to make merchandise of them as a result of our heritage and our being God's chosen people. They've monopolized entire industries. They've impoverished entire nations and brought them to ruin just so they can reap of their reserves, reap of their benefits, reap of what they have um, industry-wise and also just natural resource-wise. They've destroyed, they've brought ruin in there just like their father, the devil who sought to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the ministry and the work of the devil in the synagogue of Satan is exactly like them. And this is what we see in our world from those that take the promises of God and use them in lasciviousness and use them in a lying sense and, and, and think that they apply to them and they are above reproach and above rebuke. But they've forgotten that they had to observe the voice of the Lord God and keep his commandments. And those are so far away from them, they have no interest in keeping such things. And so, ultimately, they will be brought to ruin. But what a blessing it would have been if a righteous group of Israelites would have gotten a hold of a command like this and started a nation based on principles like this. I see something like that and, you know, myself being on the opposite side of creditors for much longer than seven years, if you look all the way back to when I started school, because I believe that that was the thing that everybody does is just borrow a bunch of money and go to school for a piece of paper, <laughs> you know. I've been under creditors for much longer than seven years. If you've owned a house, you've been under creditors for much longer than seven years. If, if you, you were to school, if you bought a car, all these different things that we've become creditors for, God wanted a release. God wanted a, a, a righteous dealing among his people where he would equalize everything. And certainly the person that is always a borrower 
I mean, when that release happens, they're going to borrow again. It, I mean, that's that's just the nature of things. But and the, and the one that is is wise with his money, and the one that is smart and able to be a creditor, certainly he's going to do better on the other side of the release, and it's going to basically equalize and then go right back in the same direction. But what it's trying to keep from what he, I believe, God is trying to do is to keep from it just getting so ridiculous where the rich are beyond rich and the poor are beyond poor. You know, there's a website called Spend Bill Gates Money and you can sit there and there's all these things, right, that that like a Ferrari and a mansion and a house in the hills and a house in the in, on the beach and a whole island and all these things. It's called Spend Bill Gates Money and his dollars are on the top. What I heard, you can just start clicking on Ferraris. 25 Ferraris. And just watch. The money doesn't even move. You can't even put a dent on it. You literally can't spend that much money <laughs> because it just keeps accumulating. And the, the interest rates alone will bury you in trying to spend this thing. Tough problem to have, right? But that shows you the imbalance that happens when we don't do things God's way. Would to God that a nation would start up and one day, you know, we just sang how beautiful heaven must be. There it is, just a little piece of how finances will work there. It gives you the impression that finances are really nothing. That finances are really a, a moot point. They're, they're a means to an end. They're not like they are the, the, today where we essentially worship them. That's all we think about some days. It, it's all of our stresses. It's all of our victories. It's all of our rejoicing. It's all of our hurts. It seems like the whole world just revolves around the almighty dollar. They've made a god of it, haven't they? Amen. Nevertheless, one day, all things will be set to norm. The final, I believe, year of release will be when everyone who's indebted to, to our sins and to our, our struggles and to this life and the tears and the suffering, everything will be released and set to norm. Those that didn't believe will go to hell and that'll be just set. Those who have believed will go to heaven and things will just be set so. The final release. Continuing on, let's go and talk about verse 7. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother, but thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. So there it is. The provision of needs was to simply come from the neighbor. In other words, you see your neighbor is hurt. You don't shut up. You don't hide away. You don't keep your hands closed from your poor brother, but rather you open it wide. Whatever your need is, brother, here you go. And you provide those things. And in a land where, where money wasn't worshipped and people just simply took day by day care for the provision of what they needed in that particular moment. Remember, a whole nation was built upon manna, getting what they needed daily, getting what they needed daily, and having sufficient as what their needs were, were. I don't think it would be that far of a stretch for them to simply give of the abundance to thy brother and to thy neighbor. Nevertheless, God intended it to be so, and so he commanded it so that men wouldn't stray from this. Unfortunately, greed has essentially ruined this because uh, nobody wants to lend because if I give you, then I won't have. And so that is ultimately a just a tendency and a trait of man that's been able to run wild. I think that in our economy, capitalistic as it is, and I don't think there's anything wrong with capitalism, but it has bred people that just want more, 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 get, 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 get. And then it, they don't have the poor in mind or their neighbor in mind greed has definitely ruined this type of system and caused that it would not be so verse 8 says give sufficiently for his need and that which he wanteth not holding back strategically but giving sufficiently and that's what verse 9 starts to talk about the man that was strategically hold back his money verse 9 beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart saying, watch this, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother. Now, whenever you see evil eye, that has to do with covetousness. That has to do with desiring riches. That's what an evil eye against thy poor brother has. And it says, and thou givest him not, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Now, there's a scary thought. The wicked heart says, okay, that seventh year is coming, 
And I know that I'm going to have to release unto my brother anyway. So he's asking now. He has need. I'm going to keep that back because he's going to get it in a few weeks, in a few months. It's at hand that day. And that's an evil eye. That doesn't provide today because they think that they might lose out on some extra blessing or provision on a day to come. It's just like the parable you see in the New Testament when the, the, the neighbor comes and asks bread because a visitor came in the night and he says, oh, come back another time. No, when you have available there, give unto him. I'll have to look up that reference later. It's a wicked and evil heart, I believe, that has available and withholds for a later time because of a strategy, because of an evil thought in their heart. They give not. And, and honestly, this is something that God is shunning is 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 against so much that he says hey if he pray unto thee if he cry unto me instantly it'll be sin unto thee even something that wasn't sin is it is it sin to be asked of something and to not withhold not necessarily but when god pray or when god is prayed unto and that neighbor comes and brings his petition unto the lord and says my brother would not give then suddenly he's in a strait where it absolutely is sin and he gets tripped up and god says thine eye has been evil you have a wicked heart and he judges him according to that why because it wasn't necessarily withholding the gift that was the sin but i believe it's the intents of his heart he looked with an evil eye and was strategizing about the release that was to come. And that's what caused it to be sin unto him. If he didn't have it, he didn't have it. No big deal. But he certainly had it and made a strategy and held it back accordingly. Now, if you continue, verse 10 says, Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest him. Remember the Bible says in the New Testament that God loveth a cheerful giver. Don't be grieved when you're giving for any case. Because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. What does that say there? It says, because that for this thing the Lord blessed you in your works and everything you've put your hand into. What is that thing? That thing is giving. This man has been specifically blessed for the purpose of giving. He goes to work and he reaps bountifully. He puts his hand unto some new advantageous labor and he's blessed abundantly. And God here indicates that the whole reason why I bless you is that you would give. And I believe that transcends the Christian. Christians, you are blessed in order that you can give. Whether it's salvation that God give you, he blessed you so that you can go give it to others. Whether it's financially, if God has blessed you and you have all your needs met, you have no need of anything, and He has blessed you abundantly in order that you could give to another. God here is indicating, hey, I bless so that you can give that forward. We, we receive so that we can give. What the Bible say? Freely ye have received, freely give. We talk about that when it comes to the scriptures. We talk about that when it comes to... Uh, things that go on in the church. Freely you have received, freely give. But in our personal lives, that principle also applies. You've received something that you didn't work for, salvation. You've received something that God gave you the strength to obtain your finances, your, your labors. You've received something that if you didn't have the breath in your lungs, if you didn't have the might in your hands, if you didn't have the ability, then you would not have it. You freely receive something to the end that you would bless others by it. He continues on. Again, the Lord blesses so that we can give. Verse 11 says, For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to the needy in thy land. Specifically those that are in his land. This couples with Jesus' teaching where he says, ye have the poor always with you. You have the poor always with you. Matthew chapter 26, he says that. And this also negates what we just heard in verse 4. Save when there shall be no poor and needy among you. The Bible says the poor ye shall never cease out of your land and jesus gave that a stamp of approval when he says you have the poor always with you so what does that mean that means the release will always be there that means you ought to never be covetous that means you should always give as god has given unto you and never have a wicked covetous heart and strate strategize about how you can essentially um gain off of your brother when it comes to making dealings with 
finances and, and what have you. You ought to always open wide. You have to always be a giving person. I'm telling you right now that this flies in the face of my flesh. Absolutely. This is a hard truth to learn. Certainly it was hard for Israel. I think it would have been better at a time when there was like a release, when there was God overseeing the finances of a nation in this way. I think it would be a little bit easier, especially in the world that we live in, when we're constantly being coursed and sucked into getting into debt. You can't even engage in this civilization without getting into debt. You can't buy a home. You can't buy a piece of land. You can't buy a car. You can't buy many things. They always expect you to have the card so that you can go into debt, even if it's just a plane trip you're taking or if it's just a bus ride you're taking. Let me see your card. Oh, you want a book and an event? You want to go to this? You, want, you need to go into debt, even if you have the money right away to buy it. They want you to be caught up in debt. And so in this society, certainly it is harder for us to want to give when we're constantly being being raked over the coals financially, as it were. Our whole system is based on a negative figure. In other words, every dollar that you have in your pocket is only there because somebody else has debt associated with that. Someone else owes that dollar that is in your pocket. But that also then should bring us to the realization that really, does money mean a thing? Is it really something that we should squabble and fight over, chase after? If this money isn't worth anything because somebody else owes that same dollar that's in my pocket, then maybe I should try to have that attitude where, you know what? The Lord gives, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And have everything that I have be on open hands. That's what the Bible says here. Open thine hand wide. Do you know what that means? Is that when I have something like my car, I have a wide hand with it. Because God gave it, God can take it away, certainly, right? So I shouldn't be like this all the time with my possessions. I shouldn't be like this all the time with my money. No, I have it. It's mine. God gave it to me, but I have it with an open hand. Because who knows if God should ask me, as my brother gave me this car for nothing, who knows if God one day is like, give him that car for nothing. i got to be prepared with an open hand to open wide unto my brother who is poor, to open wide unto my brother that is needy, to open wide unto my brother that is in my land. Promised land, scripturally speaking in the New Testament, is like a type of Christian living, righteous Christian living, walking in the will of God. And so if I have brothers and sisters that are walking in the promised land, that are walking in the will of God, that are keeping his commandments, they're seeking to do right and they have need, it shouldn't bother me to give unto him. God might just be using me as a chosen vessel to do his will in their lives. Now, keep in mind, like I just said there, that the people that we're dealing with that are in thy land, you know, by type are those that are being obedient, those that are following the word, those that have just come across a hard time. We're not talking here about the derelict bum that's just sitting at the interstate all day, that's holding up a sign that says, you know, my car has troubles. Help me out with a couple bucks. You know, I, I, I heard a friend of mine that actually stopped and asked the guy, what's, what's your car troubles? And he's like, uh, what do you mean? And he had forgotten what his sign even said. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, the, the carburetor verber uh, clutch a module thing. Well, you want me to fix that? What is it, a couple hundred bucks? And then, no, two bucks will be fine. Okay, you guy's a liar, right? We're not talking about the poor like the world talks about the poor. These derelict, lazy, do not want to work. I mean, the scriptures are clear. If a man will not work, neither should he eat. The brethren here that he's talking about, the, the, the people that are the poor in thy land, the needy in thy land, are trying to do right, trying to make it good, trying to work hard, trying to make ends meet, trying to be a blessing. They're working and they're just struggling. They're in a hard time. God says, bless them. They fell into circumstance. They got into trouble like any of us can in a moment of time. And despite all efforts, they are poor now. That's what God's talking about. They're working. So they deserve to eat according to the scriptures. Continuing on in verse 12, and if thy brother... An Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. So this is the area that talks about bond servitude. 
bond servitude was brought in to pay back a loan. So now you can see where that poor and needy idea comes in, where they're not the person that is not willing to work for it. Rather, they're somebody that has said, hey, I can't pay back the debt, but what I can do is I can work for you for as much as it takes to pay that thing back. Working off that loan, paying off thy debt, going into servitude in order that they could pay back a debt. But God here, though many people will be like, that's monstrous. This is slavery. No, 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 no. And we ought to consider that what God here is asking is that six years max, you would be given opportunity to go free, no matter what the debt is. Why? Because of that release. They're going to be free from it. Nevertheless, this person is not some freeloading loser. They're willing to work for it even while that time passes. It's not like they borrow something in the first year, run away and hide for six years, and then, okay, it's released. I'm good. I'm clear. Come back and dwell in the midst of the brethren. And I think that's why the foreigner was brought up as somebody you could exact it from, because the foreigner would just be passing through, borrowing, and then carrying on. You could ask for that again. But these are neighbors. They dwell among you. And this one in particular is willing to work for those six years. When that six years is up, it's done. So people call this slavery. People call this wicked. But think about our modern world. How long do you have to work in bond servitude to a company, big corporation, big heartless, gutless corporation before they release you from your servitude? If we think about it, you're going to this corporation for plus 30 plus years of time if you were to start at the beginning and work all the way through. And they, in many ways, are the ones that provide your food, provide your shelter, provide your sustenance. And, and that is essentially, in a lot of ways, if you've taken on a mortgage, you paying off a debt by going into bond servitude. The way we look at it is, aside from a very small, minuscule group of people, most of us are slaves. Most of us are in servitude toward somebody, some corporation, some entity, I don't think treats us even nearly as well as what you see set up here. And when it's all over, look at the retirement plan that comes here in verse 13. This is awesome. And when thou sendest him out, remember, he's only served for six years. No matter what that debt was, he served for six years. When thou settest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress and out of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land, and that the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee this thing today. They were to be liberally furnished of all that blessing that was there. When you retire from a company after 30 years of giving your time, they're going to give you a nice watch at best. <laughs> they're not going to furnish you liberally of all of the millions that has accumulated. They're not going to make sure that you don't go away empty, but you know, you've contributed all this time and effort. Take what is needed. Furnish your liberally out of all the flock, the floor, the wine press, all of the blessings of this big corporation are going to come upon you when you go. No, not so. That's never happened before. You'll get a nice watch. You'll get a pension. But you paid that pension, so that's not even a gift, <laughs> right? You go away with not, essentially. I like God's plan better. And when you see this, for those six years, there's definitely an interest in the one paying back the debt. Because not only are they paying back the debt, they're making a little nest egg for themselves. They're learning the skill. They're learning the trade. If they're working in a particular industry, they're learning all about that. And when they leave... It's not going to be a case where they just walk away with nothing. No, they're essentially, it's like an apprentice time. They've learned how to work the farm. They've learned how to take care of all of the threshing instruments. They've learned the wine press and how it works. They've learned the flocks and how it works. And then not only that, when they leave, it's like a fresh start. They're not, they're not, in, they're not dependent on anybody. They take with them, essentially, a starter business. They have everything that they're their farmhand had. They have everything that their creditor had. They go with them with a smaller portion of it, but they're able to now start a new life for themselves. When has that ever happened? You know, like big corporation, GM, giving you a little assembly line as you walk away so you can go and make your own little company. It doesn't work that way. But we'll continue on. Verse 15, it says that... Um, Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman. And it's good for us to remember because 
you know, when you're young, you, you have nothing. You know, I, I just had a, a conversation with the Giesbricks, and, and they're, doing, they're doing well. They got a nice business down there, and, and they're able to, you know, uh, build themselves a nice little home. But they said, you know what, when we, when we started, we had, a, we had a cardboard box for our only table, and we sat on the ground, okay? Remember where you came from, and, and, and consider these things when it comes time to give and to gift and to bless others that are around you. Now, continuing on in verse 16, it says, And it shall be, if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee. And so this is where I say, it's not slavery like we think of slavery. It's not servitude like we think of servitude. Even if I, have a, I work for a wonderful company these days, I'm never going to say this to them when it comes time to retire. I've never seen anybody say, I don't want to go away. I want to stay here forever. <laughs> no, everybody wants to get away. It says, because he loveth thee in thine house, because he is well with thee, then thou shalt take an all and thrust it through his ear unto the door, and he shall be thy servant forever, and also unto thy maid servants thou shalt do likewise. So, is this slavery? Uh -uh. I mean, they love it. They enjoyed it. But I will say this. When it comes to slavery, how we think of it, what went on in the southern states and, and how that, that um, Confederate flag is just looked at as like the worst thing in the world and all the wickedness that happened, I've learned that like 2% of people own slaves. It was a very small minority. I've also learned that of that percentage, not every slave was just like you see in the books or in the movies where they're just beaten and whipped and their life is miserable and it's just awful and all these things. I'm not going to say that that was every scenario, but that's the picture they like to paint. If you just think about it, if, if, if you own somebody as a bond servant and their job is to get up and work for you every day, what kind of person making that investment would make sure that their servant was just beat within an inch of his life every day? You're not going to get a lot out of your worker there. But I don't know. I just think that this whole idea of slavery is misconstrued. And I think oftentimes, though the history books would never write about it, I think it went like this. I, I've, I've heard stories of slaves that when they released them, you know, when, when the North came down and finally said, no more slavery and abolish slavery. Just so you know, the Northerners had slaves too. So there, there's something. When they abolished it, a lot of them were like, this is my home. I enjoy it. I like working here. I don't want to go free. How can you force me to go free? This is, this is my, my, my master. I work for him. I like him. I love him. He loves me. We care for one another. I've raised a family here. There, there were scenarios like that. So it wasn't always just awful and terrible. But you got to wonder about the picture that's being painted and why this is becoming a big deal now. It's division. They're trying to create division among people. Red and yellow, black and white. And anytime there's kind of a division based on the color of your skin, you can say right away it's stupid. It's wrong. Okay, because God's word gives no provision for us to be separated based on our race. Certainly countries were separated. Certainly things were broken up by that. But race, I believe it's not even a thing scripturally. We all came from one man, Adam. We are all of one blood, the Bible says very clearly. Just in a little aside there. Verse 18, it says, It shall not seem hard unto thee when thou sendest him away free from thee, for he hath been worth a double hired servant to thee in serving thee six years, and the Lord God shall bless thee in all thou doest. So the bond servant came, learned the ropes, took care of the debt, went out. It shouldn't be a bother unto the creditor at that time to let him go. Look, he, all he's done in these six years, and God here again promises to bless further as a result of what? Obedience to his word. Continuing on in verse 19, and we'll just close up these last few verses. It says, All the firstling males that come of thy herd and of thy flock, thou shalt sanctify unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work with the firstlings of thy bullock, nor shear the firstlings of thy sheep. The Bible here is requesting and commanding that the first fruits of thy flock and of thy herds will be sanctified or set apart unto God. But look at this now in verse 20. It says, Thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year in the place which the Lord shall choose thou and thy household. And I love this because God, when he receives something that's set apart for him, doesn't just leave you with nothing. He actually says, bring it and enjoy it with me. Partake of the offering with God. And I believe 
That's the same thing that goes in our lives when we give freely and liberally unto people, when we give our money at church, when we give our money to the brethren, when we give our money to our neighbor. God doesn't just, he accepts that gift, certainly. He blesses you as a result of it, and that's the truth, is that you're blessed because of it. So you're partaking with the Lord. You're not just giving, and it's a loss, and that's it. No, God accepts the gift, and you partake of it with him. Verse 21, and if there be any blemish therein, as if it be lame or blind or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt eat it within thy gates. The unclean and the clean person shall eat it alike as the roebuck buck as the heart. And it says, only thou shalt not eat the blood thereof. Thou shalt pour it upon the ground as water. And so if the first fruits have some sort of blemish in it. God's like, that's all right. Sacrifice it in thy gates. Eat it the same. Enjoy and partake of it the same. Showing again that mutual benefit to giving. You give, God gives. You give, God gives. You can't outgive God, okay? You can never outgive the Lord. God will always bring back to you more. And this isn't a prosperity message because it may not be financial. Like I said, you give 20 bucks and God's going to give you 40 in the other pocket. And you're like, this is great. I'm just going to keep going. No, it's not always like that. But God will always ensure that there is a mutual benefit. Blessing you as a result of your kind heart, as, as a result of your generous spirit, as a result of your giving unto him. He will always make sure you are blessed. You know what? If it's not in this life, well, how beautiful heaven must be when you celebrate and rejoice in all that you've given down here on this life, and God will be all too happy to reward you abundantly in the life which is to come. The Bible does talk about loss, losing, giving, sacrificing, right? And how sometimes it doesn't come back to you in these days. But when that day comes and you leave this earth and you're with God in heaven, you will certainly not be upset for not receiving the blessings here in this life for that which is to come. Sanctify things unto the Lord. Give and be giving as a person and you will partake of the mutual benefit of serving Christ. And that can only be good. That will only encourage and enrich your life. You will never regret giving unto God and God's people. You will never regret serving Him. And I'm thankful for that. Dear Lord, I thank you, God,